The Southeast Asian nation of Malaysia is one of the wealthiest countries in terms of per capita around the Asian continent. Its economic rise was due to its strong ability to drive domestic and foreign investments to the allocation of government budget properly and, most importantly, and in today's video, the ability of the government to generate a lot of money by procuring properly enacted policies. The Malaysian government generates a lot of money every year. These are commonly known as government revenues. In 2021, the federal government revenue amounted to over 233 billion Malaysian ringgit, or nearly 52 billion US dollars. These considerable revenue sources come in two forms. The first is known as tax revenues, and the second is known as non-tax revenues. The concept of tax revenues is simply defined as money taken from from its citizens. These can either come from income or corporate taxes, or they could come from indirect taxes such as excise duties, export and import duties, and SST. These tax revenues collectively generated more than 73% of the government's revenue in 2021. Non-tax revenue, on the other hand, comes from the issuance of government licenses and permits and investment income. Investment income is an essential scheme because it generates a lot of money. Non-tax revenues generate the remaining 26.8% of the total government revenue annually along with licenses and permits. The share of non-tax revenues in Malaysia, on the other hand, is extraordinarily high. At 26.8% of annual contribution means that it far surpasses most of its neighboring countries and is even better than other developed nations. The reason for this is that Malaysia's taxation system favors lower rates. Most most developed nations are often known for their extremely high tax rates. Some developed nations even have as high as 80% in their income taxes, whereas Malaysia's highest is kept at 30%. Malaysia does not even have a GST tax law, which is quite the norm in most nations. All of this happens because non-tax revenues play a huge role in the government's overall revenue. The country is well known for its strategic line of investment vehicles. These are commonly known as government-owned enterprises, where they are either partly or wholly owned by the government, and when they generate money, they eventually send it back in the form of dividends. The dividend received by the government are then used to fund other projects and initiatives. Examples of these large investment vehicles are the likes of the Kazana Nacional, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Malaysia, Telecom Malaysia, the country's national telecommunications company, and even Maybank, the country among Southeast Asia's largest financial institutions. These are just among the largest sources of revenue for the government. However, investment income does not always come directly from government-owned businesses. Investment income could come from overseas investments or foreign loans to other governments. It could also come from the country's petroleum and palm oil industries, or it could also come in the form of grants or aid. But this is not seen in Malaysia. The government would then use the same capital to fund national operations. Operations. This is in the form of what is called government expenditure, much like government revenues, but instead it is where the government allocates the money it receives. In 2021, the government spent a whopping 330 billion Malaysian ringgit or more than 71 billion US dollars, which is 20 billion dollars or 100 billion ringgit more than what it generated in the same year. Why this occurred will be discussed in a while. For now, we must first see where the government is spending over 71 billion dollars. In Malaysia, the budget is dispersed into ministries and agencies. These individual departments then use the budget for their agendas. For 2021, the largest agency to receive the bulk of capital went to the Ministry of Education, receiving nearly 50 billion Malaysian ringgit or 11 billion US dollars. This is then used to bolster the entire educational system of Malaysia. By creating schools, improving classrooms, sponsoring university studies, and more, 
The following important agencies are the likes of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. Just like the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health also has to use the money to pay down necessary schemes to operate, building hospitals, paying nurses and doctors, and more. The agency that received the lowest funding out of the top 10, however, went to the Ministry of Transport, which only received around 10 billion Malaysian ringgit, a huge difference from the Ministry of Education's 50 billion ringgit budget. But of course, this does not mean that transportation infrastructures will be limited. This is because budget allocations in each respective ministry do not always represent everything about an entire industry. For example, we can source infrastructure costs from the private sector, taking the framework of public-private partnership, or we could also source it from foreign loans. Then this brings us to the very question. What would happen if the government of Malaysia spent more than it makes? Well, as simple as Finance 101 is, they would have to borrow money. They can do this in two simple forms, domestic or foreign debt. In Malaysia's case, however, most of it is borrowed domestically. In other words, the excess $21 billion the government spent in 2021 will be registered in the country's total government debt, which is a fiscal concept that has always increased since the government's operations have continuously been in a deficit. The government's debt steadily increasing year over year due to deficit runnings, however, is not entirely new. Many nations, developed or developing around the world, always run into a deficit. Some of them even run their country with a larger share of the deficit compared to Malaysia. Although there are special circumstances that allow a few nations to be exceptional. But either way, Malaysia's government deficit is one of the causes of the debt to grow. This growing debt, however, can be a good or a bad concept. For example, in 2021, the Ministry of Finance received a large share of the government budget. They were in the top three agencies. This is because the Ministry of Finance is the one responsible for managing the country's overall debt. That year alone, they had allocated 18% of the government revenues into debt alone, meaning for every dollar or ringgit the government makes, over 18% of it goes back to servicing debt interests. If the government continues to run into a deficit, the larger the deficit, the larger the money it has to pay down to service these debts. Amongst the many reasons that cause the government to spend too much is that it is due to a lack of government revenues. They just are not generating enough money to service the country's goals. If the public demands a new railway, a new road, and a new hospital, but they do not generate enough to fund what they want, then the government will have to turn to loans. But another aspect is that the government needs to borrow money for the country to grow. It works just like how businesses operate. If they want to grow by buying a new machine, but can't afford it with the cash they have, they can turn to loans to buy the machine, which would in the coming years yield better results. From our perspective, Malaysia's budget, which is heavily invested in their educational system, means that they are trying to yield a high human capital system. This will invite more foreign investments, improve productivity, generate more tax revenues, and so on. The fallacy in this statement, however, is that what if the Malaysian government invests in many programs and does not result in a net positive in investments? Just like a corporation that invests and fails to make a good return, the corporation would either declare bankruptcy or find other ways to pay down its debt. In Malaysia's case, it means that it will have to increase its taxes or, in worst case scenarios, also declare bankruptcy. These failed ventures could also be in the form of political corruption. For example, the recent 1MDB scandal, whose investment was thought to yield returns to the government, yet had been the opposite. The final question is, what if they take in too much debt? How can the government make more money? Other than raising taxes, they could also take money from their investment income, which is derived from government-controlled corporations. They could liquidate some of their assets or sell the entire business to private corporations. They could also tap into the international reserves held by the government or even through its sovereign wealth fund. However, it might be overly complicated to do so and would not likely take place unless certain conditions are met. 
In some cases, however, when a country goes into too much debt and can't make money, it will have to turn to foreign aid. Nevertheless, these are just scenarios if the government fails to do its duties. More likely, these will not happen as Malaysia is a powerful financial nation with robust government operations. While at times there is political instability, it has at least been noted that the government operations in Malaysia are some of the best in the Asian continent. Its rise as an economy, after all, is not always due to its natural abundance of resources, neither it only derives from private corporations or even the miraculous skilled workforce which led foreign and domestic investments to increase, but also due to the capability of Malaysia's government throughout the decades it has been operating in modern history. But anyway, what do you think?